Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alejandro Trujillo. I'm from the University of Canberra. I'm a specialist working with eDNA, um, and it's my pleasure to invite you to um, this module 4.5 on the conservation genomics for treatment uh, threatened species management uh, from bio platforms. Uh, let me just share my screen. Now, um, just very quickly to run through the module, um, we're going to be talking about what eDNA is, uh, what are the benefits of this, uh, like capturing these kind of samples for the environment, what are the limitations on eDNA re based research, and how we undertake sample collection and storage as well. Um, I'm not going to take a very technical approach to this. I feel that uh, enabled to ensure that the end users like yourselves are able to um, understand and undertake eDNA research is just important to minimize the amount of jargon that we currently use in this in this area. But just to begin with, um, eDNA is simply DNA collected from environmental matrices. It can be done from soil, from water, from air. There's multiple methods and multiple ways in which eDNA can be uh, captured from the environment. And the capacity that we have in doing so is that we're able to extract and analyze this eDNA which then can give us information on the presence or absence of a species in a given setting, in a given environment. Um, this, of course, has blown up in the amount of applications and capacity that this kind of technology can, can allow you to do. Um, of course, having the option of not actively having to target the uh, targeted as species or the communities that you're looking for um, really brings up a plethora of opportunities in terms of how cheap uh, monitoring can occur, how quickly monitoring can occur, um, but it of course brings in some limitations. Um, right now, it, there's quite a lot of applications that are that are still being explored. The most common ones are of course in the detection of target species in biomonitoring and biosecurity. Um, there's a lot of uh, applications around how you're able to detect rare species for the purpose of conservation, uh, which is of course the case of uh, these online modules and anything that you can do. Um, in, a, in being able to capture eDNA and not just eDNA, but uh, the other molecule, which is eRNA, you're able to assess living assemblages of ecosystems. You can assess species abundances. You can determine um, if uh, populations are limited and how they're growing in, in a given situation. And it also allows you to understand how to better monitor a given ecosystem. Um, and of course, if you were to use meta barcoding applications for this, then you would have uh, a massive range of opportunities of what can be done. Having that power of understanding if a species is or not in a given ecosystem or in a given system is quite powerful. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to what brings that can be brought by eDNA based monitoring to um, your applications and your systems. Um, but it also has limitations and most of the of the limitations are not inherent to eDNA. These are limitations that occur um, across uh, genetics and DNA based research. Um, in the case of eDNA, there are chances of cross contamination from alternative sources that are not your main target are quite prone and tar and and common. Um, in these methods. There's of course issues around how we amplify DNA. Um, there's issues around how essays are, are designed and how reliable the essays can be in determining the presence of a given species. Um, there's of course the case of poor taxonomic resolution for many of those uh, organisms that haven't received a lot of attention in research uh, beforehand, um, which creates complications, but these are complications that can be um, addressed and we do have many different me methods to to minimize them and what i would like to show like what i would like to share with you all is um understanding from the uh, the perspective of the end user the stakeholder what can be done and the first thing that you should be considering is well is edna actually the most suitable way to approach a given objective let's say for example that you want to find uh, a fish in a given lake or in a, in a, in a river in, a, in the ocean, you need to consider the habitat that that's, that fish species inhabits. How big is it? And what are the complications around that ecosystem when it comes to collecting environmental samples? Um, in some cases, collecting samples are is not as safe as you could possibly ensure. In some cases, like the example that I have in the screen, 
the ecosystem is simply quite large. And this is the example from a study published in 2019 where they were detecting carp in Lake Sorel uh, within Tasmania. Uh, Lake Sorel is here and it's absolutely massive, um, which when, you, when you're dealing with such an incredibly large ecosystem, it brings questions in regards to how many samples need to be collected so that you have the resolution to really assess the presence of that species. Um, and that study uh, is quite important because it highlighted that um, when you have multiple fish, right? Um, then it's much simpler to determine the sampling design that is most appropriate to your purposes. Um, when the abundance of the species is high, then the number of samples that you need to be collecting is not is not as extensive as, as it would be. But they showed also that when you're coming down to one specimen per species, like very low abundances in such a large environment, then the sampling design just completely ex explodes in proportion. And then you would need thousands upon thousands of samples for you to ensure the resolution that you'd like to have. So you need to question, um, is eDNA the most appropriate one? Are we dealing with this, well, massive lake, like the like the case of Lake Sorrel, or are you dealing with something more like this? And this is the a, dif a different example in terms of how you would undertake sampling design. So this is the case of detecting non-permitted fish species coming into Australia from the ornamental trade. In this case, the sampling design is much, much simpler, uh, quite simply because the water is trapped in a little bag of plastic. So uh, the amount of water um, is the ecosystem in this specific case. That's the amount of water that you have to deal with. And then collecting water samples from this in this case, it's just a matter of collecting three or four. It's not a huge endeavor that needs to be undertaken. So it is important for you to understand is eDNA the most appropriate method that you have for your proposed objective? And there's, of course, conversations that you need to have with your own service providers when it comes to doing eDNA. The other concept is, uh, well, the topic of cross-contamination, and this is a big one, and I don't want to minimize it completely because it's up to the, the, the point of sample collection that this truly can be minimized. Um, and the way that we minimize the, the risk of cross-contamination is by having appropriate controls. Controls matter. They matter quite a lot, quite simply because depending on what application you have, um, there's contamination that you will simply not be able to remove. Uh, let's say you like to fish. Let's say that in the weekend you went out fishing and you used the same clothing that you used to go out sampling today, for example. Um, if you're looking for a metabarcoding assay, you're, more, you're very likely to capture the DNA from those fish that you captured when you were fishing. Uh, depending on the essay as well, you may even be able to capture the DNA from the bacon or the salmon or the chicken that is in your lunch. Um, and of course, human DNA, which I mean, you're never going to be able to truly remove human DNA from a, from a given sample. But by having controls, it allows us, the an analyst, the specialist, to understand what is the risk of them. So. There's many kinds of controls. There's field negative controls, field endogenous controls, which is, which is where you have a sample, let's say a, a, a bottle of clean water, and you spike it with uh, a known amount of DNA from a given animal. And that endogenous control allows you to understand if the workflow itself is going well, and the DNA is being extracted properly, and then most importantly, they're being able to detect it at the other end. In the case of the laboratory, which is where I sit, where I sit um, there's a case of non-template controls where we have uh, samples that have no DNA whatsoever, as well as positive controls, which can contain either DNA from the target or synthetic DNA, some DNA that we make up uh, in the facility that allows us to know that the assay is working properly. In the case of the stakeholder, the most important control that you can take is the field negative control. The field negative control allows us to understand if there's been cross-contamination at the point of sample collection and allows us to tell you if there's something off uh, with the detections that we're getting. Um, the reason why they matter is because it gives me the opportunity to provide you with a high quality answer. If I don't have controls collected at the point of sampling, I won't know if some of the detections that I'm getting in the lab are because they're actively in that given sample or they they came from outside, from other sources, from the from your lunch, from uh, from your hands, from whatever, from the equipment even. Um, so it is important to collect field negative controls, and 
as again, I encourage you to discuss this with uh, whatever service providers you have in understanding how you can better collect them. Um, so collect your field negative controls and speak to your uh, service providers to understand what other controls would be suitable for their own purposes as well. Um, field negative controls in this case could simply be the case of taking clean, uh, um, clean purified water from the facility um, or even UV radiated water um, that is just has no traces of DNA and re recreating the way that you would be collecting samples in the field without actually collecting the samples in the field. So um, those controls truly matter. Um, in terms of sample collection, of course, you can do filtration when it comes to water. You can actively collect soil from a given ecosystem. You could use swaps um, in the case of uh, a few applications of biosecurity. Um, you could even collect air by filtering it directly from the environment and capturing free sampling DNA. Um, there's many, many ways, and the, the most methods are like the ones that I present in the screen are the most common of them all. Um, and then, of course, I keep saying this, but speak to your service provider and discuss which methods they would recommend. Maybe check if they have any kits that are available um, for your use um, and just find the suitable, like a suitable method of sample collection. The most important thing here is how do you stop DNA from degrading and being destroyed uh, in the sample? If you leave the sample um, alone, in the in like if you collect it with no preservative whatsoever that dna is going to degrade and there's going to be a point where the method is not going to be able to capture that dna so normally when we collect samples uh in the field we fix them immediately um, and fixation in this case is simply a, a process that arrests the effect of bacterial degradation it arrests the effect of dna degradation in the field um, and it just simply allows you, your sample to have uh, longevity, essentially, until they get to the lab. There's many ways in which you can ensure that your samples are fixated. You can, the, the easiest one is simply to put your sample in ethanol. Um, you can also use things like DNA and RNA shield uh, and RNA later in the case of capturing RNA. So these are the little tubes that are at the bottom of the screen. Many people freeze their samples and you can flash freeze them uh, using liquid liquid nitrogen if you happen to have the opportunity to have liquid nitrogen um, or you can just put them over ice and then fix them properly as soon as you get to a suitable suitable location. Sometimes you don't really have the chance to to fix them, but I would greatly encourage that you including to your own uh, sampling design and protocols the capacity to fix your samples somehow ethanol being the most common one, but there's many other methods to do so. Um, just discuss um, how you, your samples should be stored, but then have a conversation around, around how samples should be delivered for processing. Many uh, of the facilities and labs that, you, that provide these services um, have a specific methods and or maybe they even have contracts already with delivery companies. So do check and see what they can offer. Um, and if not, just find a suitable solution in terms of how samples will be delivered. And please, for the love of God, never ship anything between Wednesday and Friday, okay? Unless things are uh, shipped overnight, most providers take much longer to deliver them to the end destination. And if the weekend happens to, re to reach the point uh, of delivery, samples are just going to kept in storage. They're going to kept in storage from Saturday to Sunday, and then they'll try to deliver them again on Monday, um, which is a risk. Um, if you have your samples, um, like keeping your samples uh, with longevity and of quality for the analysis is important. And if you have them in storage at room temperature somewhere, that is not going to work that well for the facility. So just don't send them in Wednesday to Friday. Pick Monday and Tuesday to send your samples. If they need to wait over the weekend, just keep them in the fridge. They'll be fine. Um, and then send them out on the Monday and Tuesday. So this is a very quick, very rough way of how why eDNA is important, why what eDNA can do for you, but also highlight some of the limitations, most important limitations when it comes to sample collection that you will encounter in the field. Um, I do want to encourage you all to stay for the next modules and do and I do appreciate how quick and condensed this topic of eDNA has been in this in this specific case. Um, but if you do have any questions, do let me know, send me an email. Um, I'm very approachable and 
of course, thank, thank. Uh, just I want to acknowledge all the TSI contributors that have provided their uh, funds and space for this um, for this recording. Thank you all. All the best. <laughs>